Thanks so much for joining us. Wayne, Jenny and I are delighted to welcome you to this webinar. But before we start, let's take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and, and in doing so recognise the various traditional lands on which we're all doing our business today. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, the presentation part of today's webinar will be recorded. However, the recording will end prior to the Q&A at the end of the session. I can start with a little bit about us. Uh, Jenny and I are both from Deakin University and Wayne's from the Geelong Region Local Learning and Employment Network, uh, the Geelong Region LEN. We're collaborating on a project which aims to address workforce gaps in the supply chain industry. And this particular project is supported by the government um, by funding through the local jobs program. Uh, for today's session, we hope it's going to be very practical. Uh, that's, that's our aim. Uh, we're looking at, at coming up with some ideas on recruiting for greater diversity and for creating and importantly sustaining uh, the sort of workplace where all employees feel valued and when difference is seen as a plus, was seen as a positive. Uh, our views are based on some recent research uh, that Jenny and I did into the barriers to diversity and inclusion. Uh, and we were looking particularly at the supply chain and transport industries. Uh, we interviewed over 100 women about their experience. And we also interviewed 24 senior supply chain execs, uh, talking to them about the challenges that they were facing um, recruiting post COVID. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, Pat, for the introduction. In this webinar, we, we, we're really going to focus particularly on what small business can do to create and sustain diverse and inclusive workplaces where all staff feel really welcomed and can be productive. Our backgrounds, well, I have over 25 years experience in supply chain logistics sector, working both domestically and internationally, and seven years as a COO for a leading white goods company Pat's uh, background in, is in research on workforce capability and diversity. And Wayne is the CEO of a not-for-profit incorporated association working in the community and education space. The three of us, uh, we bring very different views and perspectives on what is a really important issue for businesses of all sizes. And as Pat mentioned, we hope our conversation will be really useful for you today. Thanks, uh, Jennifer and Pat, for the introduction, and welcome everyone today. And great to see so many people online to come along. So, appreciate it. Um, we'd like to fin spend a few minutes today just telling you about the Supply Talent Pipeline project. It builds on a, a framework which was developed by Pat to address long-standing misconceptions about supply chain careers. Our aim is to create a new recruitment pipeline by focusing on women and young people, two groups currently underrepresented in the industry. The project looks at structural barriers to recruitment, retention, and promotion across the career life cycle. It looks at why women apply for roles and the sorts of things that stop them from being recruited and going on to having a successful career. In our first year, we're focusing on the Geelong region. In the second year, we'll shift our focus to the southwest of Victoria. Jenny, can you tell me a little bit about some of the things that the project is working on currently here in Geelong? Yes, of course. Um, our intensive program is designed for students, job seekers and career changers. So it includes visits to local workplaces and we're running some workshops and those workshops are being tailored for the groups that we're working with. We're also working with local businesses and this is a really important part of the project to develop digital resources which showcase the industry's changing image. And we really want to increase the understanding of the breadth of career opportunities that supply chain can offer. We've developed videos of women working in the sector, e-resources and some online courses. They're all available on the Grilling website, easily accessible. But we're also working with local businesses on how to create and foster the sort of inclusive workplaces that, that will really support attraction and retention outcomes. So we've developed a diversity toolkit and we'll be holding a forum with industry in October this year. And we hope that many of you will join us for that forum. We've had some terrific support from local supply chain businesses in Geelong and we really want to work closely with the sector 
as we roll out this program. Okay, we'll that's now. thinking um, now about, you know, why diversity matters to, to businesses. Um, you know, why it, it, it's important to, to, to think about this issue. And from our perspective, we believe that achieving workplace diversity requires diversity of thinking and listening to a range of perspectives. And that's why we've structured the, the webinar the way we, we have. Wayne, Jenny and I have very different experiences of the workplace and we look at this issue quite differently. We come from quite different angles. Uh, but importantly, we also want to hear from you. We invite you to join the Q&A at the end of the session and, and we hope you'll share some of the challenges and successes that you've had, the things that have worked for you um, as, as you've looked at pro progressing workplace change around inclusion in, in your organisations. Uh, diversity means different things to different people. Uh, for me, diversity is about what makes each of us unique and it includes our backgrounds, our personality, our life experiences and beliefs, all the things that make us who we are. And it's a combination of our differences and, and it shapes our view of the world. It shapes our perspective and how we approach all sorts of things. And I think, Pat, as the slide indicates, diversity is also about recognising and respecting and valuing differences. You know, it could be based on ethnicity, gender, age, religion, disability, sexual orientation. Yeah. I, I believe it also includes an infinite range of individual unique characteristics, um, experiences, communication style, your career path. What what what, what have you been? What have your life experiences been? You know, educational background, income level, marital. It goes on. Marital status, whether you have children, um, and I think these variables really influence our personal perspectives. And it's, of course, it's not all aspects of diversity are visible and they, this adds really to the complexity of the discussion. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, but look, however you define it, there's no doubt diversity um, impacts a company's bottom line. It, it can make a difference. That there's research showing consistently that diverse and inclusive organisations uh, outperform their counterparts. They do better than their counterparts in terms of financial performance, uh, employee satisfaction and overall success. And that's as true for, for small and medium enterprises, for SMEs as it is for the big guys. Um, diversity brings together people from different backgrounds, from different experiences, and they bring different perspectives and ideas. And, and different individuals bring different skills. They bring different knowledge and they bring different approaches. So that when you bring together a team of people from different backgrounds, they can come up with some really innovative, out-of-the-box solutions, things you may not have, have thought about. Uh, the, the other aspect here is that when you broaden your recruitment strategy to increase diversity, you open up access to a pool of skilled workers that are sometimes overlooked. Um, we're in interesting times at the moment, Australia's experience it's its lowest unemployment rate in almost 50 years. Nearly a, a third of Australian organisations are saying they can't find the staff to fill the jobs. But at the same time, you've got 3 million people looking for work or who are working, but they want more work. But Yes, but Pat, despite those unemployment figures, you know, women still continue to be significantly underrepresented in a number of Australian industries. We focus on transport, postal and warehousing, but that, that's the same for construction, gas and water, waste services, manufacturing, wholesale trade. You could go on. And just on that, the diversity can improve the customer experience too. It, it matters to customers because when teams are from different backgrounds, they're in better position to understand and meet the needs of their diverse customer base. When you understand your customer's base, you're in much better position to develop products, services, and marketing strategies that they want. Yeah, and if, if I can add here, when an inclusive work environment means that the products and services that you're going to design and they're accessible and relevant, you know, to all your customers, I think you can reach new markets and customer bases that you that you mightn't have concentrated on before. And if you're able to win in this competitive market. Your, your customer experience team really has to be able to empathise with their customer base. It's, it's so important. 
and it, it just brings such a, a wonderful different perspective to to your business yep yeah true jenny and another benefit is that individuals see that an, an organization develops diversity and provides an inclusive environment they're more inclined to probably stay that organization and and join them for a start off so i think it's really important that way I've worked in a number of businesses, all sizes, and whatever size, if the environment is inclusive, staff feel valued, respected and included, they're more engaged and motivated to succeed. Yeah. If, if I can summarise where we've got so far, a diverse workforce helps you attract a broader range of candidates, leads to a larger talent pool, and importantly, it helps you keep good staff. But I want to raise another factor here too. Um, Corporate social responsibility is becoming more important for SMEs as well as for larger organisations. And increasing the diversity of your staff can help with your ESG reporting, your environment, social and governance reporting. Because when you embrace diversity, when you really um, acknowledge diversity, you're demonstrating your commitment to fairness, to equality and to equal opportunity, and you're helping create a more just society. And, and there's certainly re research, including the work that Jenny and I have done in the supply chain industry, that shows that younger workers, both men and women, want to work in companies that value diversity, and they want to work with companies that are committed to sustainability and environment. It really matters to them. It matters to them that companies value people and the planet as well as profit. Yeah, agreed, Pat. And I think if I can add here, I mean, small businesses have deep roots within their local communities. I mean, especially in the Geelong region, um, it's quite community-based. So engaging a corporate social responsibility allows us to give back to the communities that support them. It doesn't need to involve a lot in terms of resourcing either. It might be sponsoring local events or supporting local charities or in engaging in volunteering activities. By being socially responsible, Small companies can strengthen these community relationships and create a positive impact within their own communities. Yeah, it's important to, important to say, to acknowledge here, though, that smaller companies face particular challenges when recruiting for diversity. They're, they're more limited when they've got more limited reach when they're attracting a diverse range of candidates. Um, but there are some resource neutral ways to encourage great, greater diversity uh, in the people that apply for positions in your organisation. Uh, if we could start at the beginning of the recruitment process, I think it's really important to consider diversity when you're designing your PD and your ads. Um, I think it's really important to avoid the unnecessary nice to haves. To, if you set overly strict or unnecessary requirements, it'll discourage people um, from applying, discourage women and underrepresented groups in particular. Um, th there's evidence, for example, that women tend to apply only when they meet 100% of the criteria, whereas men apply when they only meet 60%. But I think it's also important to avoid operational experience and let, this is an absolute must have because that's something that can be very easily learned on the job in fact often it's better learned on the job um, and it, if it's there it can disadvantage women one of the other points on the slide here is targets um, i think targets are not always popular um, but they they often come up as an option to increase diversity and they're generally, but they're not generally feasible for SMEs. I think a useful alternative would be for hiring managers to be to, to routinely need to explain, you know, why they weren't able to produce a diverse shortlist. And perhaps another way to ensure the PD is inclusive would be at things like salary range. Um, what's if the compensation is negotiable? Um, women and some underrepresented groups are really good at asking for things for other people, but we tend to yeah. not be as good at that when we're looking for something for ourselves. And I think it also helps to really highlight what the growth, career growth opportunities are. Perhaps you could offer some mentorship programs, maybe training initiatives or, or some professional development opportunities, you know, uh, within the organisation. I think that's very attractive, particularly to women. Yeah. Um, some tips from me on hiring for diversity, um, particularly for, for SMEs. Think differently about where you advertise. Look at new ways of attracting underrepresented groups. 
uh, social media, different recruiting agencies, look to industry bodies too. Um, go out of your way to target groups outside your normal networks. Um, can you sort of reach out to some of the professional networks and take part of, in some of those events that target women in particular industries? There are a number of, of supply chain women's groups, for example, aren't there? Jenny, Nawo, Wayfinder, yes. there are a number of really good mm -hmm. groups out there. And, and look at your marketing materials from a diversity perspective. Does your website reflect your company's values and approaches to diversity? It can be really powerful to include quotes from um, current employees sharing their career journey. Or um, Jenny, we've done some videos for our project, haven't we, um, with women at Cotton On and Timber Trust, uh, with them sharing their experience working for the company. They, it makes for some pretty powerful um, messaging. Yes, and they're really useful to include when, you, when you're advertising a role to, to show that that role is available for women, if there's women speaking about doing, currently doing the role. But I think it's also worth checking the, the wording of the ads for the PDs too. Sometimes there's some inherent bias in the job title, things like salesman or security guard. You know, perhaps it would be better to describe it. I think the railway sections had, had a wonderful result with changing some of that terminology to protection officer because it better describes the role. And, you know, is the language age inclusive? You know, are you using words like tech savvy, fresh, young and vibrant? You know, that's really going to put off older workers from applying and Try and avoid the jargon. I think when you're in a sector, you tend to throw it around and we know what it means, but not everybody else does. And that often discourages people, you know, who don't have specialised operational experience to apply in the first place. But they they put, they would still have the skills that you're looking for and it, it sort of precludes that, that group. Penny, I had absolutely no idea what 3PL or EDI or back ordering mm. were until I started working with you and supply mm. chain, Jenny. That's what I mean about throwing the, throwing that terminology yeah. around, often even in interview and you don't realise you're doing it. Yeah. Okay, millennials, millennial and Gen Zers, younger people, what are they looking for in a job? If you know what people are looking for, it really helps when you design the P PD. Uh, we found in our research, younger workers were looking for jobs that align with their values. And that's something we picked up earlier. They want to make a positive impact on society and the environment. It matters to them. So they're looking for employers who prioritise sustainability and ethical practices. So evidence of corporate social responsibility matters to them. Uh, company culture and approaches to diversity matters. And it's why it's really important if you can to make sure your company values and your approaches to these issues are available on your website. Another aspect is work-life balance. It matters an awful lot more to younger people than it did to my generation, to our generation. Uh, young people value flexibility in terms of scheduling, scheduling and they value remote work options and paid time off. They, they want a job where they can maintain a fulfilling personal life alongside their work obligations. I think too, salary, salary matters to everyone, but younger workers, when we spoke to them, were more likely to take into account other perks, things like time off, employee discounts, wellness programs, perhaps tuition reimbursement to encourage them to further their studies. But they don't have to be, these issues, things don't have to be expensive. Um, vouchers, perhaps even a half day off for Christmas shopping. I think all, all of these things help bring in the family and friends and, and those sort of opportunities, if you can tailor those sort of, sort of opportunities to include family and friends, perhaps it's a voucher to go to the cinema, this really builds loyalty. And I found that yeah. in the past when, when working with um, employees in previous organisations, they remember those things. And I think while career progression opportunities matter to everyone, I think younger workers are looking for employers who offer those training opportunities. It's it's very important for them to have clear pathways to progress. Yep. Thanks, Jenny. And Pat, I, I know you, you've done your research and you've um, yeah, taken a lot of time uh, and practicalities and looking at industry and talking to people, but what did your research say about women applying for a particular job, Jenny? Uh, I think when we interviewed the women, um, what came across really, really strongly is that they loved working in, in supply chain. Um, 
they really enjoy the high tech, the high speed, high stakes game of it all, managing often multiple interactions at the same time, and require, which really required uh, use of a rich mix of skills. And that was particularly evident during COVID. You know, the, things were shutting down, the supply chain had to keep moving, people were working from home. So, so that, that part women really enjoyed. But I think overwhelmingly they, they liked the people aspect. Um, even though it's becoming increasingly tech focused, I think supply chains is still very much a people business and things like building relationships, working with people, that's really the main game. That's how you get things, keep things moving. It's, it's your relationships with your colleagues and external stakeholders that really make a difference to keep that reliable supply chain moving. I think they like diversity in, in the role. No day is ever the same. The day to act day activities really change and there's a huge variety within and between supply chain roles. Um, they see it as a job for the future. You know, COVID really showed that as other sectors were um, letting people go, supply chain was really ramping up. So they see it as a future-proof role and I think importantly it's it's well paid. They It always comes through problem solving you know, that ability to do complex um, problem solving. And it's very attractive to people who like patterns and trends, you know, when they want to look at data and data analytics, that's really important to enjoy that. And that. And from the women we spoke to, Pat, they really enjoyed that yeah. part. Yeah. And I suppose lastly what came across very strongly for me was particularly with the younger people we interviewed, younger women we interviewed, they are very concerned about supply chain and its contribution um, to sustainability. Um, they see supply chain, efficient supply chains can make a real difference and not, not just to the planet, but the bottom line. But I think for them, it's very much focused on the planet and doing the right thing and making a difference. I think that covers most of what came through strongly in our interviews. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Uh, that's, that's true. Um, I want to think now about how we can take how SMEs can take these ideas forward. Um, they've got fewer financial and human resources. They're less likely to have the time uh, or the expertise to create formal inclusion policies and procedures. Uh, so, you know, how, how it's possible to do that given those restrictions. There, there is a plus though. Uh, smaller businesses uh, can be much more agile and nimble, and that's a real advantage in managing issues of diversity and inclusion. Uh, looking at some of the, the building blocks here. One of the building blocks is that ability to offer the flexibility that we talked about earlier that can support um, uh, work-life balance. And, and post-COVID staff know that productivity is not defined by how many hours you spend in the office, but by how successfully you've, you've performed your task. So this concept post-COVID of redefining work as outcome to achieve, not a place to go. Uh, Wayne, what's your experience, you know, working in a smaller organisation, managing workplace flexibility and the expectations yeah, post-COVID? Yeah, I think, you know, COVID obviously changed a lot of things. And I think, um, you know, we were a fairly flexible um, staff anyway, but I think it's also allowed people to, to work more so from home, to have that flexibility of part-time um, and to be able to change days or finishing times, et cetera, yeah. to, to sort of suit their lifestyle. So I think that's probably come out through COVID and, and we've tried to embrace it here um, in our organisation. And, you know, the staff are very good and they are um, very engaged and, and always wanting to do the best. So I think it, it's, it's been good. I think that forced flex, flexi working from home, it, it showed us all that it was really possible. You know, we, in so many organisations, we hadn't even thought about the possibility of doing that. And, I mean, obviously it won't be possible for all jobs, but I think hybrid models working two or three days a week is becoming the norm. Um, and we know it's something, I'm not sure if you say twats or twats, but it's the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday workforce <laughs> now is really catching on. But I think flexibility is not just about working remotely. There's so many other options that you can offer people. Um, you can make flexible start and finish times. You know, we see that in organisations across Geelong, the way they've been able to change their shift patterns to become more family friendly. They can offer part-time job share, casual work, perhaps 
allowing staff to purchase additional parental leave, um, job sharing, flexible rostering. You know, I, I think these, these days you can work really from anywhere in the world and it's, it's opening up recruitment opportunities. And I think you've got to look at the costs involved. People think, well, that's going to cost too much to offer additional paid leave, but you've really got to consider the costs of, of needing to recruit and, the, and those often hidden costs that you don't consider when you need to um, re-recruit for a role. Yeah, po policies are really important, um, but we know HR, HR managers in small organisations handle everything. They, they do the recruitment, they prepare the employment contracts, they do the PD, the professional development, they do the employee reviews, they handle the workplace complaints and, and they oversee, oversee workplace health and safety. They, they have to do it all. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, there are lots of places to go for advice and support, Pat. Um, there are a number of websites with guides and resources and are very helpful in setting up policy and procedures. Um, in, in Geelong, we have probably a, a, you know, a range of HR specialists that um, I know some are in the room today that can assist with some of these things. So I think, you know, that's part of this is creating that awareness. As part of the Supply Chain Talent Project, we developed an inclusion toolkit. It covers a lot of things we've been talking about, plus includes a list of resources that are available on time. The inclusion kit is available on the project website along with a number of other resources free. Um, at the end of the web webinar, we'll put up a link to the project website or we can send out a copy to anyone interested. Okay. Um, the focus of our research was supply chain. And interestingly, that's an industry really that never sleeps. Jenny, you were in a senior position in a supply chain company for a long time. Is it possible to achieve work-life balance when the industry operates 24-7, 365 days a year? There are a lot of industries where that's the case. You've got very long hours. Um, mobile devices and instant communication sure haven't helped because people are pretty much contactable all times of day and night. Well, I think there's no simple answer to that, Pat, in terms of what work-life balance means. It, 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 it sort of means different things to different people you know, and what your personal circumstances yeah. are, but it also depends on the nature of the work. Um, I mean, I've got a few ideas that I think would work. Um, you know, if you make that work-life balance a part of your company values, you know, you may not be able to allow people to work from home all the time, but you can offset some of the long hours, you know, with some allowances, maybe some wellness opportunities that I mentioned earlier in the additional leave, um, and perhaps some periods of remote work may be possible. But I think you need to be upfront. You know, you really need to let your employees know what you expect in terms of hours um, and what is and isn't possible. And again, you know, perhaps it could be offset, you know, with some salary compensation, or maybe, you know, if that's not possible, some additional leave um, when it suits the company's operations. Because there are some times where companies do sort of ramp down a bit, and that might be a time to give some um, compensation there for some staff that have done those longer hours and where it's not always possible but where you can I keep saying please look at looking at family friendly shift options it's working in companies you know in a lot of supply chain companies you wouldn't expect to be able to do it they've, they've found a new way to break through and and offer that flexibility and look at early morning meetings you know if, it, if it's not possible to avoid it particularly those pre-start ones you know, maybe, maybe some people can dial in remotely and give that option, share that around. Okay, Wayne, you're CEO of a small not-for-profit and you've had some senior management teams in a number of companies, larger companies as well. Is it possible to, to achieve flexibility when you've only got a small staff? Yeah, thanks, Pat. It's, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, I spoke earlier about having, you know, part-time positions and being flexible with start and finish times. I think that that's important. Um, you know, obviously things come up sort of in the everyday and you've, you've got to make adjustments. So I think that's part of having that flexible workplace. Um, you know, job sharing is something that, uh, you know, I've been familiar with and where staff have sort of multiple skills um, and they can swap and adjust their schedules to meet that. Um, we don't have a lot of space here um, where we are now. Um, and that allows, you know, we rotating staff through and, maybe a couple of days at home and for a staff might free up some of the office space or our staff will even take that on board and organise their own meetings to come in um, as well as having maybe a meal or something or a coffee catch up 
I think that always adds to that staff morale, which is really, really important. Um, and obviously having clear communication is, is really important. I have an open door policy uh, and everyone knows that. So we can always have a discussion if needed. Um, you know, I've got great staff and I think that flexibility um, encourages them to and empowers them to take ownership of their work, which they do and benefits everyone. Um, my staff know that the organisation values them and, and we trust that um, they get great outcomes for the LEN. Yeah. Look, let's focus for a minute now on the recruitment process itself, okay? You've got your inclusive PD and your inclusive ad, but you also need to make sure that the evaluation criteria you use at interview are also inclusive, inclusive that, so that you don't inadvertently disadvantage anyone. That, Jenny, your that, thoughts? Yeah, that's where resume screening um, using AI tools can be useful. When, you, when you've got a large number to shortlist, you know, you can set criteria on, on the qualifications and experience that you're looking for. Um, but I think whether you use that software or not, you, you need criteria that really focuses on the skills, qualification and the potential of the candidate, you know, rather than subjective traits and, you know, starting to introduce that unconscious bias. Um, I think it's important to consider those transferable skills we all talk about a lot. It's, it's because it's not just years of experience or years of experience in a specific industry. Um, I think I go back to that thing of looking for potential and how that person, you know, rather than their past, as what, look at the past performance, but think about how that person can bring, what potential they can bring to the business as your business grows, because your needs are going to change as well. And I think set the interview tone, you know, it's bring diverse perspectives you may and you may not be a large enough organization to have a panel interview but you could always consider bringing other colleagues in for the second interview and that way you're going to get a, a multiple perspectives and I think it helps you reduce um, bias and I think you have a more comprehensive evaluation of the candidate it's not just you know how they how you react to them and perhaps if you can do some unconscious bias training with your staff you know try and build their awareness of how they can be influenced by stereotypes. And, you know, I think we all do those mental shortcuts, you know, and often we don't mean to make those snap judgments, but we do, you know, we base it on gender, race, age, and I think we have to be careful not to do that. Pat, you've done a lot of work in this area of unconscious bias, you know, could you perhaps share some of your thoughts here? Thanks, Jenny. Um... First up, biases are, are often really deep in, deeply ingrained and, and they influence our perceptions and our actions. We're just not aware of it. Um, some common types, uh, affinity bias, that's, that's when you feel more positively to people who have similar backgrounds and experiences to you. And it's a very natural thing to do. You, you, we all want to belong. So we tend to prefer candidates who are like us we understand people who are like us so that that tends to mean can mean you favor them unconsciously um, there's a halo effect that's when you have a really positive impression of someone based on just one characteristic there's something that really impresses you about them and then that influences all of your other thoughts around them uh, an example of gender bias is assuming women will be less competent with technical stuff or that men will be better leaders. Um, there's a motherhood penalty when employers assume that mothers are going to be less committed or dedicated to their careers. And it, and it can lead to missed opportunities for advancement because sometimes for the, for the very best of reasons, the, the boss will say, no, look, I won't offer that position to somebody else at the minute because I know they're really busy with, with family or uh, they're looking after their, their elderly mum at the moment. So that's going to be really, really difficult for them. So they make assumptions based on the, the, the situation for, for the best intentions, but it is bias. Racial bias is when people are treated differently. Again, this is very unconscious, but it's based on race. So, and it might mean something like monitoring a particular store employee of, of, of a particular race more closely than the others. Um, unconscious bias based on age, can result in assumptions that older employees are hopeless with computers or less adaptable to change, or that 
younger workers will lack experience and of course their biases. If we talk about retention for a minute, attracting a diverse workforce is just the beginning. But if you bring people into your organisation, you have to look after them. And, and that means acknowledging the complexities of diversity and actively encouraging inclusion. It's, it's not just about recruitment. If you keep top talent, if you, you keep really good people, um, all organisations, whatever their size, needs to fo focus on fostering the sort of environment where people want to stay. And, and that means a safe and inclusive workplace, one where everybody feels they belong and have a chance to grow their career. Yeah, Pat, I think, um, you know, like employee turnover is expensive, not only because you lose valuable staff um, and because there's those exit costs also, but when an employee, employee leaves, there's the additional cost to recruit and to train new people. From your experience, Jenny, why do you think people leave jobs? Often it's a lack of opportunity for career progression. I know I mentioned that earlier, but I think that's a big motivator for employees to look elsewhere. I think younger employees in particular, they really expect opportunities for professional development and training. And often they're told they're going to be given training and interview and then operations get things change and that doesn't happen. And I think they can become quite disillusioned. And I think including the opportunity for secondment and shadowing is, is wonderful for younger people. Um, it's, it's not just things like salary rises or formal training, it's that shadowing of somebody else in the sector that you respect and getting that opportunity to connect with more senior people via that shadowing can be, can be hugely appreciated and not often done enough. I think, we keep saying about good company culture, but that's a, another really important factor. There's not, nothing worse. A toxic workplace, I think, is a major uh, factor in causing people's decisions to leave a company. And it's often not the company they're leaving, it's a bad manager. You know, um, people spend a lot of time at work, so it's not good for their mental health um, if and they'll make that call to leave. So I think companies really need to monitor that experience for workers and, and look at managers and make sure that um, those sort of toxic environments are stamped out very early. And look, money does matter. Um, I think if you feel appropriately recognised and rewarded by your employer, it's, it's much easier to stay. I think we've all been in those positions where, you know, when you're well looked after, you don't think about leaving. And I think, you know, if you're not able to always increase salary, those other financial incentives that I spoke about earlier, things like gift cards, bonuses, often in organisations, salary discounts can be huge and it doesn't um, impact the bottom line, perhaps as much as offering things like bonuses, but they can be really helpful depending on what your company products are, of course. Um, but those sort of opportunities are, are huge. And it also builds brand loyalty because people have them in their homes and, you know, if they can offer those discounts to friends and family again, that um, can, can really make a big difference. And make people, as we keep saying, make people feel, you know, very valued. Jenny, I want to pick up the comment you made earlier about com company culture. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, I think in my experiences that, that poor workplace culture uh, can really lead to poor morale and stress um, and it can do reputational damage, you know, with increased staff turnover. People know when you're having high staff yeah. turnover, it gets around, you know, that sort of negativity in the workplace is really contagious. I've, I've seen it affect a whole team, you know, where people, other people can be feeling really positive, but they get dragged down by it. And I think, you know, if you've got policies in place, yes, but, you know, you need to be annually reviewing it and make sure that, you know, you don't have those sort of internal barriers, things like bullying and gender gender equality, even with sexual sexual harassment. You know, no one likes to think it's going on, but we we see in the news every day that that these things are still happening. So, I think you have really have to monitor it and um, have policy in place to do that monitoring and really look at inappropriate behaviour and make sure it doesn't persist because staff will leave. They'll vote with their feet and 
you know, I think that is probably one of the major influences on, on what on why people decide to stay or leave an organisation and social media, you know, if we go back, but it can move, bad reputation can move very, very quickly. And I think, you know, have efficient systems, you know, be, have strong leaders, you know, that can come up with really clever strategy, you know, innovative products and, you know, bring talented staff into the discussions, you know, they, they all contribute to your company's success. And I think it will really give you um, a competitive advantage to thrive your business and grow, to keep bringing people in, into those discussions. What are your ideas on, on, on some low-cost, relatively easy-to-implement strategies, Jenny? I think things like providing safe spaces, you know, for employees, you know, where they feel they can put their hand up and, you know, ask questions and raise concerns. You know, it's all very well to say to people, oh, feel free to, you know, speak up. But if they don't feel that that's yeah. actually a reality, they won't. Um, things like buddy systems can be really good. I know through COVID, some of the onboarding experience was fairly poor because it was difficult. But I think if you compare a, a, a new recruit with, any, with a, a more experienced staff member, that can be fantastic you know so that they have someone they can speak to if they're having a bad day they can um, tell them that you know how to how to work through things and some of those things that are being built up in your mind is big are really only small and it helps them get over that initial onboarding do some training where you can on diversity inclusion things like this webinar you know invite your staff bring them in you know um, use online resources and external partnerships. That doesn't have to be a, 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 cost, a huge cost. And just keep revisiting your hiring practices and make sure you haven't, some of those unconscious biases haven't crept into your interview panels. Um, make sure that they're diverse. And I think give the staff an opportunity to lead initiatives, come up with ideas, you know, like a question, an idea box or somewhere where it, they can come up with something and be rewarded for, for their ideas and bring in some special days. Like I know a lot of companies celebrate International Women's Day, for example. That's not costly, but it it, it, it makes people feel good. Yeah, and I think um, I could probably add here, Jenny, you know, whatever the size of the company and, and you know, leadership from the top is, is vital in create an ex exclusive, you know, inclusive um, company culture. You know, leaders probably need, you know, like myself, you need to model that inclusive behaviour and encourage all your staff. Um, so it needs to build that trust and that, you know, if something is not appropriate, uh, that you make people um, to follow up on that. So I think it's important that leaders do a big part in setting the stage for, for their workplace. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, this slide's got a list of, of, of some of the issues that, that we see as important in sustaining cultural change. And, and look, the most important thing here is I think don't get complacent. Um, inclusion's a journey. It's not a destination. It's not about filling a quota or checking off lots of tick boxes. It takes commitment at all levels. And it, importantly, it's ongoing. Um, Jenny, some thoughts from you. Well, Wayne said earlier that leaders are important. Yeah. Um, they need to visibly demonstrate their commitment. And that's really through their actions, you know, the decisions they make and how they behave. Um, but I think we've got to come, keep coming back to that. It's not just important about talking about it and ticking boxes. You know, you have to actually live it every day. And that thing about employee involvement, I keep saying it, but, you know, give employees some ownership. I think that's really critical and encourage their participation, bring them into meetings. You know, it doesn't always have to be the senior exec. Could you have a meeting every week where you bring somebody in from perhaps from the floor or from the operational teams to give their perspective to the senior leadership group? And I think perhaps that's easier for small businesses than it often is for large organisations. But it, it's got to be embedded into your systems you know, and, and the processes right through from the recruitment process as you performance manage people as well, the reward systems you bring in, um, they all promote inclusive culture and you know, we hear this a lot, but, you know, it's that old thing, what gets measured um, gets done. 
you know, so I think it can be really use, useful to establish some metrics to measure your progress. You know, this, it's not about perfection, it's about the progress you're making. And it, it, it takes time. You know, we, we, all, we all know that. Thanks, Jenny. And now we want to hear from you. But before I start, I'd like to remind you that um, to check out the inclusion toolkit and all of the other resources, if you go to the, the Geelong Region LEN uh, website uh, and then look at the supply chain talent pipeline project, you'll see all the resources there. Jenny, I think we, we, we might be able to uh, e email if people are interested the, yes. the, the toolkit to, to those who've come, come today.